Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to Macro Pro and Friends. We are hosting special edition webinars of our Macro Pro and Friends, and this is one of many of those that we are hosting to add to our portfolio of educational opportunities for our clients during COVID-19. Um, and since COVID-19 is keeping us from gathering for our normal six-hour CEU conferences, uh, you'll be able to have access to our webinars and to some pretty fantastic speakers like we have today. So today we'll be talking about the coronavirus and the effects it is having on all of us in the claims industry, including an, a legal update um, on the recent executive order here in the state of California. This presentation today is one hour of California CEU credit. If you've logged in via your registration confirmation, a certificate will be emailed to you within 24 hours of this presentation. If you're calling in, you need to join us via your confirmation email in order to receive your certificate. On your screen, there's a section where you can enter questions uh, for our speakers and our very own Kurt Adamy from our Southern California Macro Pro offices uh, we'll ask these questions for you. Thanks, Kurt. Also, there are handouts that you can access in that same little section where you would be entering your questions. So if you have any questions, you can email uh, after the webinar. If you have any questions, you can email Kurt or me, and uh, we can see what we can do about getting them to the correct person. So this afternoon, we have speakers who are experts in their fields, and I have to say they're pretty awesome, and we are very fortunate to have such good friends who are willing to share their knowledge and their wisdom with all of you. Our panelists, uh, as I said, are all experts in their field, and we have Dee Rhodes. She's a nurse case manager. Um, excuse me, Teresa Lowe, he spoke this morning. Uh, <laughs> the Pomp Alliance. Uh, we have Chris Bowen. She's a client service director for Work Comp Resolutions. Tim Kinsey. He's a shareholder at SRTK. And we have Leslie Dilbeck. And she's the VP. Whoops. Sorry about that, Leslie. She's the VP of uh, Client Services and Relations at iRatings. So these wonderful folks are going to be sharing some of their knowledge and wisdom with you. We'll go ahead and begin with Dee. Excuse me, Teresa. Sorry about that, Teresa. <laughs> All right. We have just a little bit of technical difficulties, and I'm so sorry about that. Let me just get this started again. And here we go. our speakers and here we have Teresa Lowe thanks Teresa for your patience thank you no problem I know we're a little bit confusing us nurses um so what are the unique challenges in COVID claims um we're getting a lot of very frightened injured workers they think they may have been exposed to COVID or they show some symptoms, but they're not sure of what their symptoms are. They don't know where to be tested, when to be tested. They're worried about their families. The families are worried about them. You know, what if they do have COVID? Where do we go? What do we do? How do we self-isolate? They're feeling ostracized. They're diagnosed. Maybe they're hospitalized for a while. Then they get released back home or back to isolation and now doctors don't want to see them and they don't want to have them come into the office because the doctors aren't prepared especially occupational medicine doctors they um have indicated to us that they don't have ppe they don't have the equipment to protect themselves or their staff if someone is positive for covid19 they have fear of the unknown how, what are they going to do to get better? What are they going to do when they're discharged from the hospital? They're having issues getting medication refills. They've never been in the work comp system before, so they 
They don't know what do I do to get a refill? How do I get an order from a refill from the hospital now that I've been discharged from the hospital? Navigating through the work comp system. This is all new. Many of these people have never had a work comp injury before. So now they're faced with this dilemma of the work comp system. Um, what is, you know, for example, Express Scripts? How do I get a prescription from Express Scripts? Um, who is an adjuster? Why do I need one? What do I need to go back to work? All of these things are happening and these people are afraid. So, you know, the, what, what do we do with these type of situations? How can a nurse case manager help in these cases and move them along and help them to return to work? Probably the biggest factor I think for us as nurse case managers is to try to ease their fears, especially since they're in isolation. They're away from their family, away from their friends. They have no one to talk to. So we can call them. Um, some of the cases we've had, we've called daily. Talk to them about their diagnosis, about um, educating them on their symptomology, what they have going on, uh, just being there for them to try to ease their fears help identify them as a high risk or a low risk. What kind of illnesses have they had in the past? Educate them in regards to isolating themselves from the family or the family isolating from them. What needs to be done? How do you isolate? Do you have enough room to isolate? Are they using this one plate, one fork, one glass for that person who is ill? And how do they take that from the room that they're isolated in into the kitchen and take and take care of that and clean it safely so that they keep the fame, family safe. Where do they go for testing? We're teaching them how to find places, how to obtain results. Um, for example, there's been cases that have tested positive. They go in, they're hospitalized. They, they make it out. They're discharged from the hospital. They still have symptoms, but maybe not a fever. And now they know they can't go home. So what do they do? Okay, well, we're either gonna have to put that person in some sort of a facility or their family members in a facility. So we've got to work with claims, figure out where they're safe, if a, a hotel will accept them, or if it's better to actually move the family in a situation where a family is immunocompromised. We've had cases where they can't go home. <laughs> and then to top that all off, then the provider doesn't want to see them. They're like, no, we can't accept COVID patients because we don't have PPE in our office. So then the nurse has to search for a place for them to be tested, possibly chest X-rays to be done. Um, they'll have to be afebrile and have two negative tests then finally, at least my case was able to return home. Um, it was it was a very sticky situation because that person we also thought potentially could have a long term issue with a DVT. So X rays had to be done, ultrasound had to be done. We had to get the clearance for the patient to return home, and then find follow up with a provider for the long term care and the return to work. So we're gonna have to educate them. We're gonna, nurse case managers, definitely are gonna have to find providers. We're gonna have to call the health department sometimes to find testing facilities. Take some of that work off of claims to help out the situation, to move things along. Teach the patient if they have issues that they haven't ever heard of about the symptomology. Some patients have GI issues some with skin rashes and help them to be able to obtain medications for that, sometimes over the counter, give them their options. Um, educate them on how, if a doctor is willing to order them, how to use Express Scripts, how to get their prescriptions, um, what that all means. Coordinate with specialists if they have a DVT. You may have to call a vascular surgeon to, uh, to follow that or to follow the anticoagulant therapy long-term even after they return to work. Discuss 
discuss those long-term side effects. They're not going to know what that means. Again, they've never been injured before, and this is a scary situation. So now you're on anticoagulants, explaining to them that it's not forever, that it's until the, the DVT is cleared, then they'll be able to um, potentially go back to work. They may even be on anticoagulants after they return to work. It's not a lifetime thing. Uh, if they have one, it's just until they are negative for that blood clot. Modified duties, discussing with the patient and the employer as they get ready to go back to work. Fatigue may be long lasting. Shortness of breath may be long lasting. They may need to initially go back to work to some modified work. Uh, until they're they're ready to uh, pursue their full-time job again. They have that endurance back. So keep that all in mind. Keep in mind to be patient with them. They are afraid. Their families are afraid. And work together as a team with claims is very important during this time. Kurt, do you have any questions for me? Uh, I sure do, Teresa. I've got a question here. Teresa, what do I need to do to get a telehealth appointment? Telehealth is very important during this time as we're searching for those providers and we can't get those primary treaters to see these patients. We do have to contact the MPN, find telerehab facilities, uh, telemedicine facilities that will accept these patients, teach the patient how to reach them, then how to download the application onto their phone or to their computer, their laptop, tablets, iPads then make sure they can log in successfully and then potentially even attend those those telemedicine appointments with them to guide them to ask the correct questions regarding the COVID diagnosis. So I've got Thank Teresa, you. Teresa, thank you so much. Um, I, I do have a, a follow-up question. Um, sure. Are you seeing injured workers open to telemedicine appointments and was it hard to sort of kick people over to telemedicine versus walking into the doctor's office? Part of that feeling ostracized with a COVID diagnosis, you kind of feel like nobody wants to touch you, nobody wants to be around you kind of thing. That I think has been the most difficult portion of that. I think once you tell them, you know, this is the way we're gonna get you cleared to A, go home, or B, to get you back to work, then they're more accepting of the telemedicine type approach. But of course, I think overall, they would like to see a doctor face to face, but um, walking with them through this and having a nurse case manager beside them and there to ask the appropriate questions, I think the telemedicine is working for the patients we've seen so far. Oh, awesome. Well, thank you so much. If you'll stick around, we'd love to have you uh, when we talk about our final thoughts. So thank you so much, Teresa. Absolutely. Thank you. Next, we're going to hear from Chris Bowen. She has some pretty good information in regards to liens and the WCAB. Chris? Thanks, Wendy. Hi, everybody. Well, today we're going to talk a little bit about how to navigate the information on COVID on the DIR website. So a lot of people I know know where the DIR website is or they have it saved for EAMS and they go right to the lien section. But if you go to the DIR website homepage and then to the work comp section, has all the updates with a listing of the current offices that are currently open for virtual hearings. And as of today, there's only one that's closed and that's Eureka. So when you go to the workers' compensation page, there's an office closure information box and within the box is a list of all the offices in blue and there's a link if it's in blue. Right below that there's another blue link and it has a title of judges conference line. If you need to call in for any upcoming hearings that's where you're going to click on that and it says new next to it in red. And then right next to that there's a little green X and the green X means it's an Excel document. When you click on that, it has a list of all 174 judges, their last names, the toll-free number to call in, and the access code. It's an alphabetical order by judge. And the toll-free number really replaces the previous court call, which used to charge you for, uh, charge, and now it's free, so that's great. And starting May 4th, which was about 10 days ago, 
the DWC said they are still going to continue to hear MSCs, priority conferences, status conferences, and expedited hearings telephonically using the individually assigned judges conference line. So all lean trials and lean conferences though have been pushed out a second time. The first time that they said everybody was gonna be pushed back, it was only pushed back a week or two. And then our dates have been extended now and I wouldn't be shocked if they're extended again. My hope is that they will offer a call in for the lean conferences and the lean trials soon so we don't get too far behind. But as of right now, the dates aren't unreasonable, but it's a lot like the DMV. Can't do anything on the DMV right now uh, with appointments. So if you're a 15 and a half year old teenager like my son trying to get his permit or his license now, it's uh, you can't have an appointment. So it's kind of frustrating. But for an update on any of the newsline information, just go to that DIR website and on the bottom, it says what's new. And it has a list of chronological order of everything that we've talked about and everything that's happened on the DIR with the OMFS, canceled QMEs, um, anything, and it's all in order. And then lastly, the judges were originally slow to respond and getting back to everybody with the new technology, but they're pretty much picked up on it now and everything's getting approved pretty quickly. Appointments, responses, they're continuing to accept electronic signatures on any settlement documents, applications, pleadings, petitions, and motions. So if you don't have that capability for e-filing or for e-signatures, let us know. We've been able to get those signed for the adjusters and still get the settlements, which we'll talk about in a minute. So moving on to liens. So what's going on with liens? Well, now is a great time to get your lien settled. Most of the lien claimants are still working. Yes, even med le medical le legal management, they've been calling, calling, calling. But um, the one or two that have been more than persistent, we asked if we could just talk to their supervisor and then we were able to settle their lien with the supervisor who was a little more reasonable. So now is a great time to settle, close some files. Um, the holding out for a few dollars probably isn't worth leaving the file open for who knows how many more months, depending on if they will add the lien hearings to the call-in conference lines. So if you're stuck on just one lien and you can't seem to get that one lien claimant to come down, let us know. We probably have worked with them. A lot of these guys we've been working with now for 10 plus years and we have that relationship where we can reach out and actually say, hey, look, we'll give you this. Let's just deal with this and here are the defenses. And it sometimes is just different. It's coming from a different person. So we'll try that. Some of the larger lien groups have been trying to push adjusters to consolidate your liens right now. I uh, would not recommend doing that. You really don't have an obligation to do that or entertain it. Just settle based on the merit of your case and continue to use your same defenses that you already had. Don't let the lien claimant try to bully you or scare you into settling for more than is actually necessary. They're trying all these new scare tactics right now. A couple of them I've heard uh, is that the liens are gonna be pushed out, the lien hearings are gonna be pushed out till 2021, so you should settle now. Another one I heard is that uh, they were telling the adjuster that they couldn't get a hold of somebody at the defense firm or you know the, the lien person and that wasn't true. Uh, so they're just gonna keep trying and trying different things, unfortunately. If a reasonable settlement can't be reached, obviously wait for your hearing date. <laughs> Most of them are working from home, but they will eventually respond if you're willing to settle and you call them back, they will respond eventually. And if you need a second opinion on a bill review, let us know. We have a lot of defense attorneys right now working from home and they reach out to us and ask if we can just do a quick bill review for them because they're working on a file and they need to have something that day. So we can get that as well. Continue to utilize your internal and external resources to assist with your lien settlements. If you wanna run a buy for distant opinion as well, we can do that as well. So your accounts will be happy for the closures. Don't be afraid to close files right now. Things will go back to normal eventually. There might be a lull in new claims right now, but they will be picking up again soon, especially once people start going back to work. Okay, so now we're gonna move on to our last topic, which is walkthrough settlements. So the judges are still doing hybrid walkthrough settlements. 
It's a combination of an e-filing and email communication. So our folks have always done the walkthroughs in person. So we had that relationship with the judges. Now it's kind of the same thing. We're just emailing them and going back and forth instead of talking to them in person. So, but with electronic signatures approved for settlement documents, now is a great time to get your settlements approved. If you need help drafting and obtaining signatures from an injured worker, let us know that as well, because I know a lot of you are having issues sometimes working from home, having to print or get signatures on something. We've seen a huge increase in the amount of new referrals to draft the settlement documents, even from applicant attorneys. So we'll work with them as well and get their client to get those settlements settled. Many injured workers have been furloughed and they're anxious to settle right now. They want income. So this is a great time to reach out to those injured workers whose claims were previously stipped and are just sitting open for future medical care. We can assist with obtaining a voluntary resignation as well if you need that. Cash is king right now during the pandemic, so use your resources to get your file settled. Be careful of those injured workers who were previously receiving TD and now they might be furloughed and they're returning to their doctor asking them to be taken off work big thing right now. We wanna make sure that they're actually off work for their injury and not because they were furloughed or they're just afraid to file for the COVID payments versus temporary disability, especially if they're already in the system for TD there, I think that they're gonna get a check a lot quicker. We actually had this happen recently where somebody was getting ready to see an R file in March. And as soon as the stay at home order came out, they reached back out through their defense attorney and said that they didn't wanna settle it. So we had to, or through their applicant attorney and said they didn't want to settle it, so we had to push it back. So hopefully we can start getting things settled again. Question your doctors, question your employers, find out if it really happened. And then people are using this time at home to reevaluate and reassess what's important to them, their priorities, their jobs, their happiness. And right now could mean that when people return to work, either one of two things, either you might see more fraudulent claims because they realized they didn't like their job and they really liked being at home, or two, they might be very grateful that they have that job and they could even not file a claim, which could mean more cumulative trauma claims down the road. So it'll be interesting to see how it all plays out. Either way, now is a great time to make all your attempts at settlements and judges are getting the approvals very quickly, sometimes within days, so that's even better. There are some quirks in the system, such as suspension orders after the approval, uh, but we just write back to the judge and say, hey, I think this was accidentally you know, put on calendar and they usually take it off within a day. So if you see anything like that, it's normal right now and we can get anything that happens like that fixed usually within a matter of a day. So if there's any questions. Kurt, do you have any questions for Chris? Actually, I've got two, Chris. Uh, first one, what are you seeing regarding approvals and settlements? So right now, uh, normal approvals have been a little slower to come in as a referral, but then drafting and actually getting signatures has increased well over 50%. And then the actual approval from the judges are definitely uh, faster than they usually are. However, some one or two of the judges is a little bit slower. I would say on average, we're seeing one to two days. There's a few judges out there. I think they're just a little bit slower to get through their emails, so three, four days. Um, overall though, it's definitely still going strong. I would say we're getting about 10 to 15 approvals per day right now, compared to a normal day is 25. So we're down a little, but nothing against the judges. Okay. What is the board's position on electronic signatures on settlement documents? What is the what position? Oh, the board. So they're fine right now. It's approved. Everything's electronic. So it's absolutely approved right now for any electronic that was uh, sent out over the DIR about two or three weeks ago. So it's in that uh, link in on the DIR website. They actually talked that it is okay to do the electronic signatures. Last question. What is your opinion on photocopy services filing non IBR med legal cost petitions that go back years? These are being set, set without serving carriers and us just getting hearing notices. Is the WCAB doing anything that these copy services bills nothing? 
Okay, if I think I, if I understand the question right, I, they're talking about this actually being set for a hearing based on the copy service. So there is a whole section in the DIR website about copy service. So the first thing we would do is obviously look at our defenses, just like any other lien, and see if they filed the information, what was it they're copying, all of the normal defenses that you would have for regular copy service. And there's a whole section in there. So for that question, if they want to email me separately, I can actually copy and paste that for them and send it back to them. And then, of course, we would just have to go to the hearing and take care of our defenses. Thank you, Chris. Thank you. Thank you, Kurt. And thank you, Chris. Um, I do have one quick question, Chris. Sure. Um, you may have already touched on this, but I'm going to ask it again because it okay. just sort of stuck in my head. Are you finding um, in all the venues um, that the judges are being cooperative in the settling? Yes, um, the judges, like I said, I think a lot of it has to do with our relationship with them. I'm not sure how they are working directly, maybe with adjusters one-on-one -on -one or other companies, but at least with us, we've been to the board every day. We have four people that go out every single day to all the boards. So those judges know them in person. And so when they're emailing them, I think the judges are being a little more, I wouldn't use the word lenient, but they're they're able to communicate and we probably won't even send it to the judge until we know exactly what it is the judge wants. But the judges are um, very quick to email back and tell us what they need versus a lot of times I'm seeing the adjusters have sent it in and the judges just set it for if they suspend it. So we're getting a lot of those where the uh, the adjuster tried to submit it on their own and then the judge suspended it and then we get it later after the fact and we're able to still get it approved. So if you have suspensions, we'll still get it approved for you. We just have to figure out what it is the judge needs, get that from you and then work with the judge to get the approval. Great, thanks Chris. We certainly appreciate your expertise and your knowledge and your wisdom. So thank you and please um, stick around so we can have your final thoughts after our webinar. Okay, okay thanks. And next, we are going to hear from a Tim Kinsey. He is a, one of our good macro pro and friend friends. Uh, he's a shareholder at SRTK, and they have offices throughout California. Most of you probably already know Tim. Uh, Tim, can you give us a legal update on the current laws? Can you include in that the executive order that just came out? Absolutely. Um, good afternoon, everyone. I hope everyone is doing uh, well and staying healthy uh, out there and all this craziness and madness that we've been having to deal with in the last couple of months. Uh, as a defense attorney in the uh, state of California practicing defense workers' compensation, uh, I often, too often, have the opportunity to uh, talk about case law or legislation that uh, isn't necessarily beneficial to employers or insurers. And this uh, certainly is no uh, is no different. On May 6th, our governor issued an executive order, uh, the basis of which he has uh, indicated that uh, COVID, um, if a couple of conditions are uh, met, is a presumptively industrial injury. Um, those of us who deal with safety officers are painfully aware of what presumptions are. Uh, for those of you who have not had the uh, um, experience of having to deal with presumptions. A presumption uh, basically is a legal mechanism, mechanism where a, a fact or a, a matter of law is, is presumed to exist without proof. So it shifts the burden of proof to us as defendants to have to prove that an injury did not occur. And that's exactly what the governor has uh, set forth in his executive order. Uh, basically what the governor has indicated is that uh, if an employee tests positive for COVID-19, or is diagnosed with COVID-19 within the last 14 days of performing any services uh, outside of the employee's residence at the employer's request or direction, um, then uh, that COVID-19 is presumptively um, work-related. Uh, and this presumption is retroactive to March 19th, uh, 2020. So prior to that, the presumption doesn't exist. If those conditions are met after March 19th, 2020, we have a presumptively compensable claim. Uh, if the testing shows that uh, it's positive for COVID, the presumption kicks in. Um, if uh, it is merely a diagnosis, 
of that diagnosis must be made by a California physician, and that diagnosis must be confirmed uh, with testing, positive testing, within 30 days of the diagnosis. If that occurs, it's a presumptive injury. So um, the presumption is rebuttable. Uh, originally, there had been a lot of pressure on the governor to uh, make the presumption conclusive, in which case there would be nothing that we could do to try and defend it. However, it is rebuttable, and we can uh, attempt to rebut that with discovery, uh, both from a factual, medical, and legal basis, um, even though it's a presumptive, uh, presumptive claim. Um, it, is, it sunsets in 60 days, uh, so we have 60 days of this from the, uh, the onset of the order on May 6, 2020. Uh, as we're all painfully aware, uh, what is projected to occur can change 24 hours before it actually occurs, so it would not be a surprise to see the governor extend uh, this executive order uh, on the 59th day. Um, but as it stands right now, it's set to uh, last only 60 days. One of the most important things uh, that has come down with this executive order is the fact that it indicates that once a claim form is filed, we have 30 days to deny the claim or it will be deemed presumptively compensable. As we are all aware, we can do 90 days in our heads, in our sleep. We know what that date always is under Labor Code Section 5402. However, this changes it. Uh, we do not have 90 days, we have 30 days. That is an extremely tight, short timeline to do what we need to do um, to do investigate into the claim. If we do not deny the claim within 30 days, it will be deemed presumptively compensable, just like it would if we didn't deny it within 90 days. And we cannot use any evidence that we could have obtained within the 30 days um, to rebut the presumption. So it's just like 5402 in the 90 days, except it's 30 days. So it's a tight timeline. We want to watch that. Uh, the presumption allows for uh, all workers' comp benefits, so TD, PD, uh, apportionment, medical treatment, hospitalization, um, and death benefits. Although uh, the presumption uh, also uh, indicates that death without dependence um, has been taken out. So in other words, God forbid we have someone who um, passes away from COVID-19 with no dependence, we no longer have to pay the state, so there is no valid death claim uh, under this current existing uh, piece of uh, executive order. TTD is uh, payable. Um, however, as we all know, it's usually certified within 45 days. Every 45 days in a regular claim, it's every 15 days for the first 45 days with respect to COVID. It's a much tighter time frame for the employee to get certified for TTD. Um, also, while the diagnosis only needs to be made by a physician licensed in the state of California, the TTD certification must be by a physician who has both a physician and surgeon license. So interesting that that went in there. I don't know if it was a mistake or not a mistake, but it's something we are definitely going to be looking for when we get those TTD slips, if we get them, to make sure that it is uh, authorized by the, by the appropriate physician. Um, other than that, keep in mind that 30 days, what do we want to do? We want to be getting on the phone with the employee. We want to be finding out uh, what type of uh, protocols, uh, what type of PPE is required or utilized in the, in the office, at work, what type of exposures they've had at work, potentially what type of exposures they've had at home. Have they gone to parties? Have they gone out? Do they have relatives that have tested positive for COVID? Do they have a family member in the household that has tested positive? These are all things that we want to be finding out within that first 30 days, um, if possible, uh, because, again, it's a very tight time frame, and frankly, I don't see... Uh, the ability to actually get a medical opinion uh, within that first 30 days um, uh, very quickly. Uh, it's difficult enough to do it as it is now um, in 90 days, let alone 30 days. So I can see a lot of these claims being denied for the need to conduct further discovery and secure a medical opinion. Um, but we've got to do our due diligence and, and get moving on this within an only 30 day time frame. So um, any questions? Okay, Tim, I got three questions. When do you when do we pay TTD if the employee has other sick time available? So that's a great question. The uh, piece of uh, legislation or the executive order by the governor is very specific. Uh, it states that we have to the employee has to exhaust all um, COVID nineteen sick time uh, that was made available in response to COVID nineteen before we uh, have to pick up TTD. 
So that doesn't mean regular sick time that was around on the books uh, prior to COVID-19. It means sick time that was created especially to deal with COVID-19. So for example, uh, the FFCRA, uh, right? The Family First Coronavirus uh, Response Act uh, creates additional sick time. Uh, if that is available, that has to be used before we're on the hook for TTD. Um, if an employer has created an additional bank of sick time to deal with the COVID-19 situation and is applicable only to COVID-19, that must be used uh, before we're on the hook for any TTD. So that time that has been created before, specifically for COVID-19, must be used before we first pay TTD. Does the presumption include all employees not just safety it does it includes all employees uh that uh have been working outside of the home at the uh, employer's direction again after march 19th if you don't know an employee if you don't know an employee test positive but doesn't present any claim wait excuse me if you know an employee test positive but doesn't present any claim do you owe them a dwc1 like a store checker and likely got it from another employee, but the employee didn't get it at work. If the employee has not specifically asked for a DWC-1 and said, I think this is work-related, can I please have a claim form? The answer is no. I would not recommend that we provide a DWC-1. We have the old Honey Honeywell case <clears throat> that basically indicates that um, we are not on the hook for providing a DWC-1 uh, unless uh, the employee basically specifically asks for it. Uh, and um, only egregious conduct, such as a refusal to provide a DWC-1 uh, or uh, tricking or lying to the employee about his ability to file for workers' compensation benefits would uh, come into play there and potentially start our 30 days before, before we, uh, we gave him a, a claim form. But we are not physicians, we are not uh, uh, judges. Uh, we cannot make that determination. Uh, it is up to the employee to provide that claim form or ask for that claim for Tim, two more questions just came in. What happens if they go to the ER room and the PA comments on his illness? Do we make them go back to the doctor and get an, an MD medical certification, all this in 30 days? Is that correct? Well, that is up to the employee. So the presumption does nothing to change the, uh, the burden on the employee to get those facts in motion that give rise to the presumption, right? So it's up to the employee to have to get that diagnosis and to get that testing within the 30 days, or it's up to that employee to get the testing. Uh, it's not up to us to, to create his case for him. Okay, last mm -hmm. question. Employee is paid via COVID sick time for a week and they are off for an additional week. Will the three day waiting period apply? There is no three-day waiting period for uh, TTD under the uh, under the new presumption law, under the executive order. No waiting period at all. Thanks, Tim. You got it. I, I appreciate that you answered those questions. I do have um, a couple other little quick little questions. Sure. Um, what if by the time the, the employee realizes that they are sick, they have then put been put in the hospital and they don't have the opportunity to ask for the uh, DWC-1 form. Well, again, uh, that would require us to somehow be doctors and understand that um, they're alleging that that is industrial. Again, it's a presumption that it's industrial. Once the DWC form is filed with us, uh, if the criteria are met, uh, however, it's not up to us to say, well, you know, this may be industrial, right? As we all know, practically in California, everything may be industrial, but we're just not handing out claim forms left and right. It's up to the employee to to make that determination and to and to file that or to okay. request the claim form. Okay, thanks. And then I have one more uh, that came actually via text, like the last one. Uh, do you think employers and insurance companies will file suit to protect, or excuse me, file suit in regards to their presumption? I, I have heard that that might be a possibility. Um, I, I also tend to think that uh, the 60-day sunset uh, that was placed in the executive order is uh, somewhat of an attempt to preclude a constitutional challenge because that is a very short time frame to uh, to challenge the executive order. There may be a basis for it. 
Um, but I think with 60 days, um, that that's a, that's a very short time frame to be able to do that. And I think potentially that's why that 60 days was put in there. If you see an extension of this, uh, I would not be surprised if that was talked about a little more seriously and openly, and there were some um, some active movements to to actually do that. Great, thanks. Uh, Thirty days is not very much time when you're talking about uh, getting records. Um, only forty to fifty five percent of the custodians um, of records right now are even working in their offices. So that's a pretty fine, tight little line. It is. Walk. Yeah. Great. Thanks so much, Tim. Can you stick around so we can get your final thoughts? Absolutely. Wonderful. Thanks. Our next speaker is Leslie Dilbeck, and uh, I think most all of us in California know Leslie. We know uh, that she is known in California, and um, actually she's probably one of the top experts in the ratings arena um, throughout the United States. Not only is she good at what she does professionally, Leslie is a champion for being kind and she exudes everything that's good. Leslie, can you talk to us about ratings in this COVID-19 world? Absolutely, thank you for those kind comments and thank you Macro Pro for having my ratings be part of your speaker panel today. Um, I certainly do miss doing trainings in person and hope I'll get to see y'all face to face in the not too uh, distant future. Um, but as we go through um, today's discussion about ratings in this current time, um, I kind of want you to think about your cases. And I want to think about, I want you to think about the ones that are stuck. The ones that are stuck because you either don't have the impairment rating or settlement negotiations have come to a stop. So, for example, um, you may have had a QME evaluation at the time, uh, you know, the end of March, and that was pulled out from under you and postponed indefinitely. And that's really what you were waiting for to get the final answer as to what your uh, permanent disability value was on your case. Or maybe you were in the process of negotiating settlement with African attorney, but you were perhaps waiting for a supplemental report from the evaluator. And now you kind of are at a standstill. There's, you may think there's nowhere you can go until you get that crucial information. But I have some good news for you because I think that you actually probably have the information you need in order to get to your conclusions about PD value already in your claims file. So when you look at what we do at iReadings, Typically, we're asked to validate an impairment rating. So what does that look like? We get an AME report. You ask us to review it um, to determine if the evidence supports the impairment rating. So how do we do that? We look at the clinical findings, the exam findings. We um, look at the person's present complaints. We look at the doctor's records review to see what the MRI reports might be telling us. We look at uh, maybe, uh, you know, what the physical therapy notes say contained within that QME report. Those are all records that you're probably sending to that QME evaluator to have them um, make a determination of um, whole person impairment in your case. So that's information you already have contained on your file. So we're kind of moving to a different disposition where um, you don't necessarily have that QME report or you might just have the uh, primary treating physicians report and you're needing to have that validated so that you can have a good piece of information in order to base your settlement. Now, when we look at what clients are doing currently, um, instead of maybe, you know, feeling that they're stuck in that situation, looking for creative ways and alternatives to push um, the file towards settlement or maybe push it, um, maybe you need a settlement analysis. Maybe you need um, to set up reserves on the case and you're just kind of at a loss and you're waiting for maybe a, a crucial piece of medical information. So in looking at typical situations that might be kind of similar to what you guys are having to deal with now, we actually deal with this on occasion at iRatings. So um, for instance, we may have a client that their injured worker has moved to, let's say, I don't know, Iowa. Okay, pre-COVID, let's talk pre-COVID. They've moved to Iowa, um, they live in Iowa, they're getting treated in Iowa, they're uh, determined to be at maximum medical improvement in Iowa, and for whatever reason, they can't come back to California to get their QME evaluation. 
But the doctor in Iowa does a final report. They don't do, they don't use the AMA guides in Iowa. So that doctor doesn't really know how to get to the final conclusion of what the whole person impairment is, but they actually are doing a comprehensive exam and providing that information um, to the claims adjuster in the context of a final report. And so the client will send that report to us and we may look at it and, and be able to kind of get to some conclusions. So we may be able to look at it and look at the fact that the claimant is complaining of uh, complaints in the low back. Let's say the diagnosis is a low back strain with possible radiculopathy. And we see that that final doctor, Iowa doctor report says the person has a pain in their low back going down their leg into their big toe. Well, as experts on the AMA guides, we are um, in that position to kind of know, okay, down the leg into the big toe, and you as adjusters or even you know, defense attorneys or nurses probably know, yeah, that sounds like a S1 radiculopathy. But let's say within that doctor's report, we're not seeing anything discussed about uh, MRI findings. So we may ask the adjuster, hey, can you send the MRI report to us? We wanna see what it says. And indeed it might, might show that there's um, pathology in the L5S1 distribution. So we're getting closer to being able to make a determination. We, we know at least, at the very least, this individual is probably a DRE2. Now, maybe the doctor's report does make mention of some potential reflex changes or something like that. And we are wanting to validate whether or not there's truly a radiculopathy. And so we look at box 15-1, 382 of the guides that tells us that radiculopathy has to have the positive MRI findings, has to have the complaints consistent with the nerve root, and also clinical findings such as sensory motor or reflex changes. We may ask the adjuster, hey, can you send us the prior physical therapy reports? Because that may actually contain the information showing us that there's reflex or sensory or motor changes. Um, so we can take all that information and reach a conclusion that, yeah, this individual is a DRE category, what, three, right? 10 to 13% whole person impairment. The authority that gives us the ability to do this is found and contained within the guides, page 17. And it says, if the clinical findings are fully described, any knowledgeable observer may check those findings with the guides criteria. So are we uh, interpreting the MRI report now? We're taking what those findings are and then comparing it to the pie charts, figures, and tables within the guides to reach an impairment calculation. Now, let's talk about what is a knowledgeable observer. Um, at I ratings, for example, we um, are, you know, basically the experts in this arena, and there's a very few of us that are as nerdy as myself. And um, there's four of us that are actually certified experts in disability and impairment rating. So what that means is we took a test that doctors have to take in order to demonstrate competency of use of the AMA guides. We've also taken certified impairment rater, which is offered through WorkComp Central. And three of us have been published by the American Medical Association on guides issues. So we demonstrate our expertise and, and our knowledge through those credentials. And you may have somebody within your claims office who's in a you know, similar position, maybe they're certified, or maybe um, you use another vendor who does that. And I think when we look at being able to come up with some ways to get your case unstuck, that might be one way to help grease the wheels to get things moving. So for example, when you're, let's say, trying to um, settle the case with the applicant attorney and maybe negotiations have stalled because we're waiting for that last piece of information, Maybe iRatings takes a look at that report for you to tell you and maybe the other prior examinations or other medical records to tell you what the whole person value is and what that means in permanent disability dollars. You can hold that as something, um, as a work product to negotiate settlement. Tell applicant attorney, hey, I looked at all this information. Here's what the rating is. Here's what the evidence supports. Who knows when this QME is going to be able to evaluate this claimant? Um, to get to um, those conclusions. Why don't we try and settle the case based on you know, what the evidence is showing us? And I, re it resonates with me what Chris says about cash being king, because we know that people are financially insecure right now, and you're probably getting phone calls from adjusters wanting to get those cases settled and get it closed. So um, applicant attorneys are probably impacted somewhat as well um, in their businesses, um, having you know, delays 
um, you know, at the start of all this with the, the boards and whatnot, and then of course those uh, crucial med legal evaluations being postponed. So you might be in a position to negotiate, first of all, more confidently with having something um, laid out for you in an impairment assessment like what we do at iRatings to um, help you negotiate stronger. Then you could also possibly use that as um, a basis for your settlement. So when you go to talk to the claimant about settlement, you're able to tell them we had experts take a look at this. This is what the evidence is showing your rating is. And then use that as supportive material when you have a company like Work Comp Resolutions walk your settlement documents uh, through, which as Chris mentioned, it's DocuSign and um, email. So it's getting creative during this creative, this strange time. And um, I challenge you all to do that. And with that, I'll see if Kurt has any questions. Kurt, do you have hey, any questions? I sure do. Okay. Is there a potential for any rateable impairment as a result of COVID-19? And if so, how would you rate it? Okay, so um, when we look at COVID-19, we know it's a, a, a virus. We know that it can have long lasting effects, but we also know that there's plenty of people that have been cured and relieved of it. And that's the hope, obviously. Um, but with the, the impact it does have on the lungs, um, lung fibrosis can happen, so scar tissue in the lungs. And so we would rate that um, in chapter five, the pulmonary chapter and reference table 5-12. So it's based on pulmonary function. But then there's other things like the Broadway actor um, in New York who had COVID and a, a complication from the virus was he had his leg amputated. So you would have to rate that obviously under the lower extremity chapter. There might be some impact on the heart. The heart and the lungs are tied closely together in the way that they function. They, they function together. So perhaps you have to rate for that. And maybe brain, you know, central peripheral nervous system. You know, if the person's um, not getting enough oxygen, there can be brain damage and long, long lasting effects of that. Thank you. Well, thank you so much, Leslie, for sharing all of your knowledge and your wisdom. We certainly appreciate that. Um, if we could have all of our presenters come back on because we would like to have some final thoughts. And for our attendees, please stay on for the last slide. Uh, there is information that you will see about the instructions for the delivery of your certificate. So with that, we will take a last and final thought from Teresa. Thank you. I just hope that everyone can remember that what we're experiencing is so very new to all of us. It's challenging and changing every day. Remember that any injured worker that tested positive for coronavirus, they're afraid. And so it's, it's, can be very vital to have a nurse case manager. They can expedite the care, locate providers, uh, such as the telehealth MPN providers, provide any of those providers that'll uh, provide appropriate care and treatment. A nurse case manager can help ease the fears and difficulties of those patients that are faced with the scary time in their healing process, figuring out the work comp system and issues with long-term diagnosis is if they are there. Finally, we can help them, hopefully, and our goal is to get back to work. Fantastic, thank you, Dee. Chris? Well, I just wanna tell all the adjusters that we're here for you and we, all of your vendor partners are still working, just like you. We're very proud that you're working from home you continue to email us on a daily basis and staying on top of things. And it's almost seamless from our end seeing that the adjusters are still working. And I get emails in the middle of the night. It's interesting because I can tell people are, <laughs> they care about their claims. So it's just a, a testament to how good our people are. Thank you, Chris. Tim, do you have any final thoughts? Uh, yeah, with respect to the to that executive order, um, I guess it would be just uh, remember we've got 30 days, and please remember that if you do get a claim uh, filed for COVID-19, that you're checking to see if it even falls under this presumption. 
Uh, remember, we still, we still, there are a couple of criteria that have to be met, and it only applies after uh, March 19th of 2020. So uh, don't panic. Uh, just take a look and make sure that it falls within the presumption. And if so, um, start getting on the phone and, and doing that discovery and watch that 30 days. Thank you, Jim. Leslie? Thank you. I just want to acknowledge that, you know, we're living, as you've heard it over and over again, in unprecedented times. We're all doing life very differently. We're working differently, as Chris mentioned. We're recreating differently. We're parenting differently. Some of you might be homeschooling your kids right next to you while you're going through this webinar. Um, you're shopping differently. Life is very different. And so, and with that, I'm sure comes stress. So I just, on a personal level, um, want to encourage you to be kind to yourself. Be gentle with yourself. Give yourself a break. Don't be too hard on yourself. It's easy to get uh, distracted with social media as that's kind of one of the forms of inter entertainment we have availed to us. And um, it can be that we compare ourselves to others and what everybody else is doing, whether it be they did you know, 20 home improvement projects or 20 workouts. Um, don't, don't compare yourself to other people. You do you. Be gentle with yourself, be kind to yourself, and then when you go out there into the crazy stress of the world at Costco or fighting over to toilet paper, hand sanitizer, <laughs> you're able to be kind to those around you. And when you are able to do that, I will promise you it will change your life and it will just change other people's lives. It really is life changing. So thank you guys so much. Thank you very much, Leslie. Kurt, do you have any final thoughts you'd like to share? I do. Um, I just want to remind everyone of. Uh, some of the custodians are not working at this particular time. So just uh, know that there will be some facilities that will be a little bit more difficult to get records. But the good news is MacroPro has got our fully staffed data entry team. We've also got our fully staffed production team. And they're working actually in three shifts from three in the morning all the way to midnight to make sure that we're getting all records that are attainable to you as quickly as possible. Thank you. Thank you very much, Kurt, for that. Uh, my final thought is uh, when you're looking for those records, you uh, have 30 days right now. And when you're looking for those records, if you need a, a signed authorization, I would suggest that you maybe use an all-purpose authorization instead of a medical authorization. For instance, um, if the medical authorization is just giving you the opportunity to ask for medical records, you might not get the pharmacy records. You might not get uh, billing records and you might not get um, that police report or other things that you're looking for with that uh, medical release. So go ahead and um, on this presentation, one of the downloadable documents um, in the handouts is an all-purpose authorization. So if you have any questions for any of us, please email us. If you have questions about the webinar or you'd like a copy of this presentation, please go ahead and email me directly. Um, and we appreciate that you've spent some time with us this afternoon. And this is what the email will look like on the left-hand side that you will receive that will have your certificate attached. If you look over to the left, just above this gentleman's monocular, you'll see a blue box. When you click on that blue box, go ahead and uh, answer the question and then your certificate will be sent to you. Um, if you have a problem, it might be your web browser. So you can always email it to your personal account and you can download it that way. And if you still have problems, just go ahead and, and email us and, and or give us a call and we'll see what we can do to help you. Uh, thank you so much. We appreciate that you've joined us. We will be having many more Macropro and Friends and we'll be having all kinds of panelists with all kinds of expertise. And thank you so much to all of our panelists. You're kind and generous with your knowledge and your wisdom and your experience. So thank you. Everyone have a wonderful day. Stay Bye. safe. Bye-bye. <laughs>